Greetings and welcome to this first lecture looking at democracy and participation, which is also going to be your first lecture looking at paper one. Um, slightly unintuitively, we did paper two before we did paper one. And the reason for that is, is that I think it's really important that you have an understanding of the systems before you, we now start to look at the principles and some of the bigger debates in British politics. And what I mean by that, to give you an example, is that I think that you need to understand parliament, the executive, the judiciary, um, before you can really understand um, the principles like democracy and voting behavior and electoral systems, or certainly they will be a lot more meaningful to you. So as the title suggests, in Democracy and Participation, we're going to be looking at democracy, what it is, uh, different types of democracy. We'll be looking at uh, whether there is a participation crisis in the UK, like people not getting involved as much as they should have done, or as they could have done, sorry. Um, and then as, the, as the, the whole paper goes on, we will start to look at other aspects such as electoral systems and principles such as rights and, and, and all sorts. Um, so let's get let's get started. Um, as always, I would expect you to be taking notes while you're watching this video. Um, pause the video whenever uh, a new kind of principle or concept kind of comes up. Uh, rewind if something kind of doesn't make sense. And of course, if you don't understand something I've said, or more likely I've phrased it badly, then do ask me, send me a message. Um, and of course, supplement your reading by looking at um, your, your your textbook and, and add to your notes. Uh, this is this is these lectures are very much um, intended to be an introduction to these topics, not um, the um, everything there is to say about them. So, if we're talking about democracy, we need to first ask the question: What is democracy? And it, and it's quite easy to oversimplify democracy and just think of democracy as voting. You know, we we, we talk about democratic countries um, as being ones that have elections or the ability to vote you know if, if i say to you you know this country is democratic and this country is not democratic your mind and my mind will automatically go to go to thinking oh well that means that they vote for their leaders and this means that they are a dictatorship or, or something like that and there is some truth in that but democracy is actually far wider and far more complex and can include lots of different principles so here's the first point democracy is more than just the ability to be able to vote. Because for example, in China, they do vote, but there's only one political party. So it's probably not necessarily very democratic. What about if we have a country that technically is a democracy, but actually has very little in the way of citizens' rights? Does that mean that, that it is truly a democracy? Um, what if we have a democracy but barely anyone votes? Does that mean that there is a democracy? There's lots of kind of like questions about what exactly makes a country democratic. And, and perhaps we should think about democracy not so much as a, as a switch, which is either on or off, but perhaps more of a sliding scale where we can argue to what extent a country or a state um, a, uh, is, is democratic or not. And of course, a country might be very democratic in one area while actually not being very democratic in another. So for example, America has a very strong co codified entrenched bill of rights. So in terms of protecting citizens' rights, America's needle would be very strong, but perhaps in terms of the representation you get from something from the electoral college, America's needle might be more um, in the middle for example. But as we're talking about American politics, let's have a little look at uh, one possible definition of democracy, which is from Abraham Lincoln, the famous American president. And he argued that democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people, and it shall not perish from the earth. And what he means by that is that a democratic country is one where the government is um, of the people, as in made up kind of uh, of the of citizens and and by the people, as in kind of voted for by the citizens and for the people, as in it is there to serve the citizens of their country. Most dictators or kind of monarch rulers um, in the past have been there to serve themselves. They come from a kind of a ruling class, and people have no choice in choosing their kings or queens. And democracy is supposed to be the complete opposite. The idea that a, a democracy, people should be able to choose their government, they should be able to stand um, for government, and that government is ultimately there to, to serve them, to represent them, to, to support them. And I hope already you're starting to kind of think, well, to what extent does the UK fit this ideal and, and this is an ideal this is not necessarily something which has ever truly happened but does the is the uk 
government made up of the people or do we have some sort of kind of elite political ruling class to what extent do we choose um our government and our rulers and our ministers and our um our leaders and and to what extent does the government do make its decisions to to benefit us all of those are debatable depending on the issue depending on the circumstance depending on the leader depending on the time but our textbooks and our course that we're studying argues that there are broadly speaking two forms of democracy and these are known as direct democracy and representative democracy and i'll, I'll move myself across in the middle so so you can um see the words that are about to uh, appear behind me um in the UK, we have what we call a representative democracy, which is, means that we vote, most of the time, we vote for a representative, a person who will represent us and make decisions on our behalf at some sort of legislature, which might be a, 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 a London council, it might be a the Houses of Commons, it might be a regional parliament, but we, we vote for representatives to support us and to make decisions on our behalf. What's a lot less common in the UK is any kind of form of direct democracy, which is where people make decisions themselves, which is what the point there says. A direct, a direct democracy is a community or a country or a state where people make all of the decisions themselves or the vast majority of the decisions themselves. The idea being, like, think of referendums taken to the absolute maximum you know rather than having one referendum every 10 years or so on av or brexit or scottish independence imagine that referendums were actually a common thing or maybe you don't get a referendum on one issue but actually you go to vote and you have a whole kind of like pamphlet of decisions and you you kind of say oh yes to this no to this yes to this no no to this um that is what a direct democracy would would be like the idea that all of the people are in charge of all of the decisions and the reason why i've got a picture of um the uh some kind of ancient greeks over the top right hand side is that direct democracies have existed but only really existed um in ancient greece civilizations and in small villages um if you kind of think about well how, how would it work with uh, with a country of millions and millions of people making decisions together you can kind of see just just logistically um it's a problem and so it's only really worked in in very small villages or communities where you can have a uh kind of like a, some sort of council where most people can kind of meet together you can have some sort of big debate and discussion about the various issues maybe the issues are quite simple um uh, you can kind of talk to each other understand each other and then you can kind of vote as, as a small group so so there's nothing wrong with direct democracy but it has never really worked or even really been attempted on a large scale like a like an entire country um, but the Athenian, um, Athens is a country in Greece, the Athenian democracy was one of the first examples of democracy where people got to kind of make decisions themselves. And it's, it's one of the ones that, that our textbook uses as, an exa as, as, as its example as well. However, before we get all excited about this ancient Athenian society where power went to the people and it was this wonderful um, direct democracy where everyone had true control over their lives um, there's a, there's a lovely horrible history sketch which you're welcome to kind of joke welcome to google uh, where they where they're kind of pointing out that actually this direct democracy was only the men and it was only the rich men and it was only the rich men of a certain race or culture that were actually able to vote so th this direct democracy was was at at its best restrictive and at its worst was highly sexist and racist and um and and elitist now some of you might be kind of thinking well hang on a minute um what about let me move myself to the other side what about um referendums we have we have referendums is that not direct uh democracy well it's it's an example of direct democracy or it's an element of direct democracy but it is not an entire system so yes we would say we would have to word it carefully we, we would say that britain does sometimes uh use uh limited forms of direct democracy such as referendums and and indeed america uses things called um initiative initiatives or propositions which are also kind of like limited forms of direct democracy but it's not like the entire system of 
representative democracy has been replaced with an alternative form of direct democracy. And that's actually a common mistake that students make in exam answers. They'll, they'll say, sometimes Britain has direct democracy, um, which is called a referendum. No, no, no. We, we haven't suddenly chucked out Boris Johnson and the, the whole of Parliament and replaced it with direct, direct democracy. We've just had a referendum, which is one small element of a direct democracy. And so direct, democ direct democracy, as we can see here, has largely died out. Um, if you look at some of the textbooks and, and read, more, read, more, read more widely, read more widely about it, um, you will f read about various communities, even in the modern era, that have experimented with it, but it nearly always seems to be limited to small, direct communities that have a limited lifespan. So to reaffirm, reaffirm what I said here about referendums, it exists today with referendums and initiatives, but this is in addition to re representative democracy, not instead of rep representative democracy. Nearly all modern states today either have a, a form of representative democracy or they still essentially have some form of um, dictatorship or, or monarchy. Yeah. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any ruling monarchies, although I'm sure, I'm sure they must exist. So what do we actually have instead? Most countries have a representative democracy or most liberal democracy. Western world countries tend to have uh, a, a system whereby you choose representatives to make decisions on your behalf. And most of the time this is done through some sort of constituency election. This of course, this is one of the reasons why we've talked about parliament and, and and, and aspects like that first, so you kind of know what I'm talking about when I say things like legis legislature and so on. And so in our country, we, oops, I've just moved that around. Uh, in our country, we have an election once every five years where you get to choose your, um, your local representative who goes to make decisions on your behalf in parliament. Um, this is usually done through elections, but actually it has been done by lots of other systems in the past. Um, it, so the experiments with lotteries have been done, with doing it kind of randomly. And of course, when you talk about elections, we then have to think about the franchise as well. I, I mentioned with direct democracy in Athens, it was limited to men and, and, and rich men and that. Um, if you think about the franchise in the UK, and franchise means who is able to vote, that has also changed slowly over time. Um, famously, the, the women's movement and the suffragettes movement um, were able to gain women the vote in 1918. Um, but actually what's often forgotten about that is that when women gained the vote, many men who had previously been disenfranchised also gained the vote. It wasn't just a victory for women, although it was a very famous victory for women. It was also a victory for poorer uh um, working class men who were also finally given the vote um, at that time. So just because you have a representative democracy and people have the vote, you do have to ask the follow-up question, well, who has the vote? Um, and of course, I'm teaching an A-level and it's, I'm fairly, it's fairly clear to say that most of the people I'm teaching do not have the vote, do not have the franchise, which then raises questions about to what extent, what extent that our representatives support you. Another feature of representative democracy is accountability, which is the idea that representatives can be challenged, uh, re-elected or replaced um, at election time. So the idea be here being that once someone is voted in, it is possible to keep them if they're doing a great job, but it is equally possible to remove them if you disagree with them or they're doing a poor job. Um, perhaps we might be able to think about leaders such as Putin in, in Russia, who um, by, by all accounts has been elected fairly into power, but has now become almost impossible to remove due to what's happened with opposition leaders and the way elections are run and, and, and thing, things like that. You could also, when talking about accountability, talk about, well, what is the appropriate amount of time between elections? Britain has five years through the Six Term Parliaments Act, um, whereas America has a four year term for their presidents and a two year term for their House of Representatives. Um, there are then questions that you can then start to ask yourself, well, what are the advantages of having shorter terms where you have elections regularly? And what are the advantages of longer terms where the uh, 
the candidate or the, the, the elected official has more time to do certain things before they have to kind of face election again. We, we can discuss that as the course goes on, but do start pondering in your head, maybe pause the video and kind of think it through, like what are the advantages of quicker? What are the advantages of um, slower? Let's focus in particular though on this idea of direct democracy. So again, you might want to pause the video at this point and just make sure you understand direct democracy and representative democracy before um, we kind of move on to this next section where we're going to start evaluating them. Uh, maybe even this might be a good point for you to kind of go to your textbooks and read those sections on direct democracy. Um, so what is good about direct democracy and what is bad about direct democracy? We, we've already started to kind of toy with these ideas as we talk about them. Well, the, the key advantage is it is, in theory, the purest form of democracy. The idea that actually every person gets to have an opinion on every decision. And because when you think about representative democracy, in theory, once you've chosen Bill or Ben or Jane or Janet to be your representative, that's it. You no longer have any control over any issues unless there's a referendum and referendums are very, very rare. Um, but once you've chosen your, your guy or your gal, that's it. You no longer have any choice or influence over any decision. I'm, I'm oversimplifying because there are ways to influence MPs, but you, you get the idea that when, when big issues come up now, like, like COVID or Brexit or education or schools being closed or whatever it is, um, you have to now trust your representative to make a decision on your behalf. And actually you have no way really of changing that decision. Whereas direct democracy gives you, the citizen, the power, the influence, the control over every decision that comes up, which makes it the purest form of democracy and, and gives the most amount of control to its citizens. It also helps to avoid delay and deadlock within the um, political system because you can effectively just run everything with... Uh, with kind of majorities. Um, if 51% if or 60% or 70% of citizens want something, um, it's it's going to happen. Uh, it doesn't mean that we then have to do lengthy processes of, of scrutiny and committees and debates. Um, and if you think about what happened with Theresa May, where she was unable to get things through um, because different people, different parties were kind of pulling in different directions, you know, the uh, representative democracy can get stuck, especially if you think about in America, where you've got a, a very strong bicameral system, Senate, House of Representatives, when these two houses kind of butt against each other, you can get locked, you can get stuck. With direct democracy, theoretically, if every decision is made on a simple majority, have we got 50%, have we got 50%, um, you, you take out this delay and deadlock and decisions can be made relatively quickly with a simple vote. It also means, off, off the back of that, that all decisions have strong legitimacy. Let's say that uh, tomorrow they want to change the law on giving everyone, we, we're going to raise taxes to give everyone free broadband to make sure everyone can access remote learning at home or something like that. And we have direct democracy and the country votes by 65% that yes, we're going to raise taxes slightly to give um, everyone free broadband to help them access remote learning. Um, that then is a very legitimate decision. There is strong legitimacy. So, so anyone that then kind of like, well, hang on a minute, how dare you raise my taxes? Um, the counter argument is, well, we voted as a, as a society, 65% of people said they wanted this. this. This decision has a mandate. I'm afraid we're just gonna have to raise the taxes and you're gonna have to suck it up because this decision is legitimate. Whereas, let me give a counter argument, when Theresa May became prime minister in 2016, she wanted to expand grammar schools, which had never been in a conservative manifesto um, in, in the recent era. No one had voted for it um, at election time. It was just one of her ideas, and therefore it lacked any kind of democratic legitimacy, um, especially as the conservative party leaders uh, are voted for by a very small amount of people. And in her case, there actually was no um, election to put her into place. So it was very strongly argued that her idea to increased grammar schools, whether good or bad, had no legitimacy at all because there had been no election for it. Whereas direct democracy as one of its advantages really does give good legitimacy to its decisions. But 
why don't we actually have direct democracy then? If it's so good, if it give, if it's the purest form, if it's so fast and it provides legitimacy, then why don't we do it? Well, the first big disadvantage is is that it can lead to what we call a tyranny of the majority. This is a key phrase. I'd like to see this in your essays, which is the idea that just because 51% of the country wants something, that could be extremely bad for the 49% who don't. And um, majority, I'm assuming you understand the word majority, but that's, you know, 50 above 50 percent tyranny is almost like uh, when someone is tyrannical think of the tyrannosaurus rex the scary lizard or the, the dreadful lizard it's the idea that um the oh, oh the rex is king isn't it the terrible king sorry i apologize for getting my latin wrong in a in a in a in a, le in a lecture um but the um the idea of a tyranny majority if you think about a, a country such as nazi germany think about how dangerous it could be for a majority to be able to inflict its will on a minority just because there happen to be more of them. Or think about a, a situation in, go, going back to my example here, is it right that 60% of people can vote to um, in, increase taxes and then the 40% have to then pay more? What, what if the 70% that vote for something are poorer and the 30% that didn't want something are richer and then the richer have to pay more taxes because the poorer people wanted them to? You can argue that one both ways. That's a genuine debate that comes up in most kind of economies, like how much do how much does the, the, do the rich have to pay because there are more of the poor? Um, but the tyranny of, of the majority is one of the key key core problems with any form of democracy because if democracy is all about well what if more if more people want something the tyranny of the majority is the idea that actually this can ignore the the well-being the interests the happiness of the minority again might be worth you googling tyranny of the majority for you to find some good examples of um, where that had had occurred. Um, I mean, yeah, some common example. Just think about any common example where people in this country or other countries feel massively aggrieved that a decision has been made against their wishes. For example, HS2. Think of all of the people that are angry and sad about HS2. Effectively, HS2 has been decided by everyone else that HS2 must now happen. And I'm not saying HS2 is a good thing or a bad thing. You make that decision yourself. But my point being is that the tyranny of the majority can lead to some people, I'm gonna to sneeze to, two seconds, one second. Excuse me. Um, the tyranny of the majority can lead some people to be very left out or neglected or ignored by the democratic process. Oh, that's terrible spelling. Let me, let me, let me fix that. The other issue, um, The next issue I'd like to discuss about uh, direct democracy is that people can be very easily swayed by charismatic leaders. Um, when it comes to a um, a vote, if we think 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 about um, this is a dodgy example, but you'll see where I'm going here. But if we think about the say the Brexit vote, it was very clear to see that the on the Brexit side you had extremely charismatic leaders such as Nigel Farage, you had uh, Boris Johnson. You know these are masterful speech makers that are brilliant at getting people to to like them and to trust them regardless of whether the decision w was ultimately in people's best interests or not now i'm not saying the brexit was right or wrong that's your personal decision but what i am saying is that charisma of leaders can let people cause people to vote in ways that they might not otherwise um I guess Hitler here might be another example, you know, extremely charismatic. And I'm pleased I'm not drawing a comparison between Hitler and Boris Johnson, other than the fact that they are both, they have charisma. Um, but what's, it, what's particularly interesting, I always think about the Brexit vote, regardless of the right, rightness or wrong is it, wrongness of it, is that Brexit will make the country poorer, at least in the short term. It has other advantages, such as cultural, cultural, security and i don't necessarily want to go into this but the point is is that brexit will almost certainly make most people poorer in this country which means that most people voted probably against their own financial interests now if, if they did that because they wanted to stop the freedom of movement and so on then you know that's completely within their rights but you could make an argument here that suggests that due to the charisma of 
certain leaders, they were actually able to persuade people to vote for something that will actually harm them. Same, the same thing goes perhaps with the, the, the AV referendum or the, 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 the Scottish referendum. You know, people, uh, when you look at these kind of debates, you can see that charismatic leaders are often able to get people to vote in unusual ways. Linked to that, some issues may be just too complex to be understood. Um, I'll draw two comparisons here. There was recently a, a referendum in Ireland over abortion. And the country voted that, yes, they wanted to legalize abortion. And what's, what's good about that referendum or what works about that referendum is abortion is quite a simple issue that everyone understands. They understand both sides of the argument, sanctity of life versus women's rights and reproductive rights. And everyone can look at those issues, can hear both sides, can understand both sides, and then come up with their own view on it. And essentially, when it comes to abortion, you either legalize it or you don't. There are a few other slightly more complex ones, like stopping it at 24 weeks. But by and large, abortion works as a referendum because we can understand it and it can be boiled down to effectively a yes or a no. Let's compare that or, or let's, let's give another one, which is perhaps the... Scottish referendum over independence. Okay, so that one works for, because you can do it as a yes and a no. Do you want your independence? Yes, I understand what that means. Do you want your independence? No, um, I understand what that means. But does everyone always understand all of the implications of independence? What exactly would that mean for Scotland? What exactly would that mean for the rest of the UK? What are the implications in all of these different areas? Does everyone who voted yes or no really understand all of the implications of independence? Hmm, probably many of them yes, everyone definitely not. So then we start to ask the question, is it good to have a referendum on an issue such as independence when the issues are gonna be more complex? Now let's go to Brexit. I'm going to be biased here. I don't think Brexit was a good referendum. Not necessarily because the issue wasn't important. Of course it was. But think about this. Leaving the EU is such a complex idea that involves areas of immigration and culture and the economy and security and globalization that it is a, it, it, I don't understand. I'm studying global politics at the moment at, at master's level, and I don't understand all of the potential impact of um, leaving, leaving the EU. And it is an extremely complex issue. The second yeah, and, and then in the, in the referendum campaign, if you remember, you, you had these very, very simple concepts, such as David Cameron saying, oh, we're, we're better together, stronger in, you know, which is a very simple phrase for a very complex idea. And then on the other side, you had Brexit bus saying, you know, 350 million pounds for NHS, which again is a very simple way of looking at a very complex issue that doesn't bring in or really, really kind of have any kind of understanding of, of, of what is actually going on, going on here. And then think about leaving the EU. There's... Being in the EU, then we, we have what we call a soft Brexit. Then you have a kind of a moderate Brexit, a hard Brexit, um, a no deal Brexit. Uh, you could also make an argument that a, that a referendum doesn't really always have a yes, no outcome. Um, so in my view, the Brexit referendum was, 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 was a bad idea because it isn't a yes, no decision. There are many different shades. And it's not an idea that can easily be understood by huge amounts of, 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 of the population. So I would use that example there. If you want to disagree with me, of course, please, please do so. Um, but I hope you understand the point I'm making, even if you don't agree with the, the, thread, the thread of the argument. Um, so even if we then say, look, Mr. Cox, uh, we still want to have this form of democracy. Yes, it could lead to tearing the majority, but it is still democratic. It is a majority. Yeah, there can be charismatic leaders, but actually I'm, I'm sensible enough and clever enough to understand what the issues are. And I will do my research and I will make sure I understand these issues. And yes, I really want to have this direct democracy. Is it actually practical to vote repeatedly over many issues? You know, is it, you know, with the, with the busy modern Modern life where we have jobs and studies and children and hobbies and social lives, can we all be popping repeatedly down to the, the poll office to A, vote, but even before you vote, you have to understand what you're voting on, do the research on it, think about that issue. Uh, do I really want to have a vote on fishing rights over in, 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 in Cornwall or, or in Norfolk? Um, 
do I uh, when 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 there is are issues such as well do I want to raise taxes no do I want to impl improve the police yes you know do the, do those two ideas go together um, you know is it is it practical to vote repeatedly over many issues like how would that actually work they did an experiment in a Apologies, you might need to Google this one because I can't remember where it was, but they did an experiment in a local council somewhere where they gave people some small bits of direct democracy with, within the representative democracy system. The local council was asking people if they wanted to improve public services in this, 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 and whether they wanted to raise taxes to, to pay for it. And the result always came back that people voted against the tax rises but for the improvement for public services, which, of course doesn't work you you if you want to have better public services by and large you have to raise taxes to to do so so the other issue with direct, direct democracy is that sometimes you have to vote for sad things like would people really vote for lockdown would people really vote to uh, close schools um, but have these things maybe been necessary you know for our own good you know th think about um, so sometimes you have to kind of vote for bad thing. Sometimes you have to vote for things which hurt in the short term to sort the country out in the long term. Think about Thatcher's revolution. If you, if, if you think that Thatcher's reforms were ultimately good in the long term, think about the pain and the suffering and the hardship that they caused caused in the in the short term. Direct democracy, people wouldn't vote for that. Um, and so is it even practical to have um, direct democracy? Um, I'm going to draw this video to a close here because I think I've been talking for long enough. So today we have covered uh, in this particular election, we, in this particular lecture, we've talked about what democracy is. We've talked about what direct democracy and rep representative democracy are. And then we have spent some time evaluating direct democracy. I would like you please to go and do some reading around that topic. I'd like you to think, I'd like you to take some notes, and I'd like you to be ready to discuss these issues in our next lesson. Um, in our next lecture, we will be looking at re representative democracy in the in its same in the same amount of detail and discussing what the advantages and the disadvantages of it is, and also looking at your local representatives, so you have a better understanding of who represents you and who makes decisions on your behalf. Thanks for watching. Give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in class.